Uh, welcome to the seventh annual Preserving the American Dream Conference. This year we're hosting the annual transportation event with this conference, and I appreciate everyone for being in attendance tonight. Thank you. For those of you that are new to our work, I'd like to take a few moments to introduce you to the Washington Policy Center. Uh, we are a free market think tank similar to the Heritage Foundation or the Brookings Institute, but at the state level, we focus on Washington state issues only. Ultimately, our goal is to improve lives through market solutions. We've grown from a $400,000 a year budget and a staff of four to about a $2 million budget and a staff of 15 with offices in both in Seattle and Olympia. Thank you. Thank you for that support. <laughs> Over the last three years, we've raised about $4.2 million as part of our first ever, ever capital campaign to open seven full-time research centers. Those seven centers include the Small Business Center, the Health Care Center, Transportation, the Environment, Government Reform, Education, and our bill tracking website called WashingtonVotes.org. And each center is managed by a full-time director guided by an, an advisory board made up of technical and policy experts. Many of our transportation advisory board members are in the audience tonight. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Like that pause for effect. <laughs> Policy Center measures our impact in a number of different ways. Uh, through media, legislative activity, and bills that are introduced or passed by our research. Several of our ideas have been introduced as bills this year and are still alive this legislative session. We are invited to testify in Olympia on a regular basis and we work with legislators to develop sound policy and also point out bad policy. Our work is covered over 600 times a year in newspapers, on the television and radio. And our work in the Transportation Center has also been covered in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg News, Investors Business Daily, and CNN. And we hold annual events throughout the year, including our healthcare conference in June, our environmental center conference at lunch, and our small business conference and statewide forums every fall. And our annual dinner, many of which I'm sure you have attended, uh, is attended by over a thousand people in the last two years, we've honored Czech Republic President Václav Klaus, George Will, and Florida Governor Jeb Bush. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so to continue to promote common sense policies in our state, we rely on the financial support of individuals like you. We do not accept public money, and we're not subsidized by any public agency. And now a little bit about the Transportation Center. The Transportation Center, we look at everything through the lens of congestion relief. And tonight we're here to answer the question is how do transportation policies properly mix with land use policies? And I'd like to share a little story with you that illustrates the, the mix between the two. A few years ago, we had a transportation me ballot measure uh, before voters. And I was invited to participate in a panel discussion at Seattle University Law School. And I was on the panel with uh, two other environmental groups. And the question was posed to us, how do you define, or how, how do you think land use policy should mix with transportation policies? And the guy who was, who was sitting to my right uh, from the Sierra Club, he said that he had a utopian vision of transportation policies affecting land use. In other words, he thought that the government should be able to force people to live in certain corridors and force people out of their cars and into public transportation. When the question came to me, I said, well, I have a very different view on how land use policy should mix with, with transportation policy. I said, it's not the government's role to force people out of their cars. It's not the government's role to force people to live in certain corridors. And people should have the freedom to choose where they live and work on their own, not the role of government. <laughs> Thank you, I, I, I wish I would have had the same response <laughs> at, at Seattle University in Law School, but it, in fact, it was quite different. In fact, afterwards, this, one of the Seattle University Law School professors came up to me 
and he was he was not happy. He, in fact, he was uh, quite spitting mad. At me. I was very afraid that he was going to come over the table at me. He, he asked me, just where do you get this concept of people being able to choose where they live and work on their own? Now, I, I'm usually not very good at coming up with, with the answer to those questions until two or three hours later. But this time I had the right answer. And I said, well, sir, it's very simple. It's called freedom. And his response to me was very interesting. He said, that's preposterous. <laughs> That does not sound like a place where I want to live. <laughs> Believe it or not, those were his words. Wow. This is the attitude that leads to policies like limiting how much people drive and forcing people to live in certain quarters. This is what the American dream is up against. Now, I'd like to introduce the executive director of the American Dream Coalition, Ed Grady, for a few remarks.